to I Can X Talks, Connecting the World and the Universe. I am your host, Professor Martin Tuo, coming for, uh, to you from Eastern United States at North Carolina State University. This month, we have uh, had the privilege of having, hosting two young scientists and uh, Professor Feng. And today we are very privileged to have uh, Professor Sarah Browse from uh, Belgium. Next week, we'll be hosting Professor Kim from University of Tokyo. For today, I will be joined by uh, Alice, uh, Professor Hu, uh, Dr. Hu, and Dr. Ki, who will be our panelists. Uh, our speaker today is an expert in um, electron um, uh, tomography. Uh, she was born in, in Belgium and studied physics at the University of Antwerp, where she still uh, is. Uh, from 1995 to 1999, and then she got her PhD in 2003, and after that she uh, hopped across the pond to UC Berkeley in the US where her work now started focusing on development of electron uh, tomography for material science. She then uh, hopped back to Belgium, to University of Antwerp, uh, where she uh, joined the academic ranks and has risen through the ranks all the way to full professor. She's currently a spokesman for EMET, consisting of seven principal uh, investigators and about 25 postdocs and 30 PhD students. It's a very, very big group. She's done a lot of excellent work publishing very, very good journals. And uh, uh, Sarah is uh, very well known for uh, as an expert in application and development of electron tomography of functional nanomaterials and advancing this me method to more like more realistic conditions. For example, under heating liquid or gas, gas flow experiments. She has been awarded uh, uh, quite a few awards. I'm not going to go through all of them, but most notable, she was awarded the ERC Starting Grant and the ERC Consolidator Grant, and uh, was later became a uh, uh, laureate of the Academy of Natural Sciences by the Royal uh, Flemish Academy in 2016, uh, and eventually she became a member of the Royal Flemish Academy of Belgium for Science and Technology in 2020. Uh, she received the European Microscopy Award in 2020 and the ACS Nano Lectureship in 2021, among many others. So I, I don't want to take more of your time, Professor Baz, I'll ask you to share your slide. Go ahead. Uh, Sarah, you mute yourself. There we go. Now you should hear and yep. see my slides, right? Yes, yes. Okay, perfect. Good. Okay, so uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on uh, where you are. Um, I would first like to start by um, thanking the hosts and the organizers for having me here today. Um, it's such a pleasure, and I'm very um, excited. Um, to talk to you about the three-dimensional characterization um, of nanomaterials under realistic conditions by using electron tomography. So this work was done at AMAT, and AMAT is the electron microscopy group at the University um, of Antwerp here in Belgium. And the motivation behind our research is the following. Nanomaterials consist of individual atoms. And so if we are able to determine the positions of the atoms, their chemical nature and the bonding between them, then we can provide the necessary input to predict their properties. And in this manner, we may guide or trigger the synthesis of novel nanomaterials. Now we're gonna tackle this challenge today by first expanding electron microscopy from two to three dimensions. This is what we call electron tomography. Then I'm going to show you how we can push the resolution of this technique towards the atomic level. And in such a way, we cannot only determine the positions of the atoms in three dimensions, but we can also measure valence and composition by what is called multi-mode electron tomography in three dimensions. Then at the end of the presentation, I would like to talk about an ongoing project um, where we are going to be combining the concepts of electron tomography 
with in situ electron microscopy. But let's start with the beginning and let me explain you a little bit about our group. So here you see, um, uh, it's actually a not so recent uh, group picture because um, during our most recent uh, Christmas party, there were 80 people invited. And so these are all electron microscopists. In our group, we have seven professors and we all have our own field of expertise and students and postdocs. And of course, the number of postdocs and PhD students varies a bit. But um, I would say that we have about 30 PhD students and then uh, maybe 25 postdocs. And in addition to the professors and the research manager, the industrial manager and the lab manager, we also have an amazing technical staff. And these people are helping us taking care of our instruments. For the moment, we have six transmission electron microscopes three scanning electron microscopes, and one dual beam system. This dual beam system is a combination of an ion beam and an electron beam. And using this instrument, we can prepare lamella such that they are thin enough to be transparent in the transmission electron microscope. This microscope that you see here, this picture, is showing you a, a relatively modern uh, microscope but it is still what I would call a conventional microscope. And in order to illustrate that, I would like you to compare this picture here to this one. And this is one of the newest members of our family. It is an aberration corrected microscope. And later on in the presentation, you will see why these are so important if we are thinking about high resolution three-dimensional imaging of nanoparticles. Now, um, this is how the microscope looks like from the outside, like sort of a, a, a giant fridge. Let's have a look how that microscope looks on the inside. And so here we see that at the top, we have the electron gun. Electrons um, are then guided through a series of electromagnetic lenses, and then an image in real or, as is here, reciprocal space is formed. Here you see where the interaction is going to take place between the electrons and our sample. And now when I am uh, talking to people and when I am saying that I am working in the field of transmission electron microscopy, people most of the time think about images such as this one here. And this is a very nice image. It's showing a precipitate in a matrix and we can see the projections of the individual columns. But images such as this one here suggest that a transmission electron microscope is nothing else than a very, very good magnifying glass. And what I would like to show you today is that during the interaction between the electrons and the sample, there are many signals that are being generated. And some of those signals are presented here on this slide. You can see that there are backscattered electrons, secondary electrons, um, but also X-rays, for example. And by um, aligning the microscope in specific ways and by using specific detectors, we can extract much more information than just a very large magnifying glass could do. A first example is illustrated here. Here we are exploiting the X-rays that are generated during the interaction between the electron beam and the object that we are investigating. And we are measuring the energy of those X-rays because the energy is fingerprint for the elements that the electrons have interacted with. We can also map this in an image. For example, here you see that this nanostructure consists of cobalt and iron. And if we investigate this in a bit more detail, we can also see that there is an oxidated layer at the outside of the uh, nanostructure. So this is a first approach to obtain information about the chemical composition. Another approach is EELS, and EELS stands for Electron Energy Loss Spectroscopy. Here, we are again looking at the inelastic interactions and um, the amount of energy that the electrons have lost during such an inelastic interaction is again typical for the elements that they have interacted with. So after the sample, we end up with a beam of electrons 
all having different energies. And we are now going to spread those electrons depending on their energies using a magnetic uh, prism. And in this way, we can again investigate the composition. But if we look at the fine structure of um, our eel spectrum, we can also extract information about the valence. And so this is what my colleagues already did a long time ago when they investigated the transition between cerium 4 plus to cerium 3 plus when moving from the bulk towards the surface of this nanoparticle. So a first evolution in the field of transmission electron microscopy is an evolution from only looking at structural information to more complete information using different analytical techniques that can be connected to such a transmission electron microscope. The second evolution is an evolution from qualitative to quantitative. In other words, an evolution from nice images to numbers. And um, in our group in Antwerp, quantification is the field of expertise of my colleague Sandra van Aert. And Sandra and her team are using what is called statistical parameter estimation theory to analyze our images. This means that we actually have a model consisting of a sum of Gaussian peaks, and this is fitted to the image. And so for example, here you see a high resolution image of a gold nanorod, and all of the dots here correspond to projections of atomic columns. And so by using statistical parameter estimation theory, Sandra can determine the position of all of the atomic columns. But by analyzing the area underneath the peak, she can also count how many atoms we have in a given atomic column. And she can do that with an error bar of plus minus one. Right, so when you see all of these um, results, and the possibilities of a transmission electron microscope, you might think, why is it even necessary to have three-dimensional information? And what is it that Sarah is doing there in Antwerp? Well, the answer to that question is given here. You see here a two-dimensional projection image of an unknown three-dimensional object. But I do not think that many of you could have guessed that the three-dimensional object is in fact a pile of trash. So the take-home message of this presentation today is that a two-dimensional projection of a three-dimensional object can be very misleading. Now this, of course, is a very extreme example, but it is a consideration that we have to bear in mind when analyzing any electron microscopy data. For example, here, this is a very old image. Somebody um, acquired it when I was still doing my PhD. So it's a gold nanoparticle. It's sitting on a magnesium oxide support, and we can see the projections of the individual atoms. But again, this is nothing else than a two-dimensional projection of an unknown three-dimensional object. And if we want to investigate this nanoparticle in 3D, we need to use electron tomography. Now, the concept of electron tomography is based on tomography. And most of you have been in touch with tomography. For example, if you had had a medical um, examination. Because if you go to the scanner, the doctor will take images along different directions, for example, of your knee, in order to look inside your knee without the need for surgery. So the concept of tomography is illustrated here. Suppose that we have an unknown two-dimensional object for which we have one-dimensional projection images available. If we are now going to be using those one-dimensional projection images, and if we are going to reproject them along the original acquisition angles, then you see that if we have more projections, we get a better a reconstruction of our unknown object, in this case, the logo of the University of Antwerp. Now, if we are doing electron tomography, then we are interested in the structure of nanomaterials. Um, and for example, this is a, a cadmium selenide nanostar. And so we're starting our experiment now by collecting two-dimensional projection images in the microscope 
we are not going to tilt that microscope around the sample. No, we're going to tilt the sample in a dedicated sample holder illustrated here. And we are going to collect images over a tilt range as broad as possible, and we we'll collect images every other few degrees. This results in a tilt series of images, which we can then use as an input for a mathematical algorithm that enables us to obtain a three-dimensional reconstruction of the morphology. But we can also look inside the nanoparticle, as is shown here through what is called orthoslices. Okay, so this is a concept of electron tomography. And um, now let's have a look what we can do with the electron uh, tomography approach. And over the years, we have applied the technique to a very broad range of materials. And I'm going to be showing you a few examples. I will start with an old example, and then we'll move to a newer example. So what you are seeing here is an assembly of nanoparticles. And these samples are made at the lab of Professor uh, Louis Lismarzan, uh, who will also give um, one of these talks I have seen uh, later on in uh, July. And uh, you will see his name appearing uh, many times in this presentation because we have a longstanding and a very excellent um, collaboration on the three-dimensional investigation of uh, nanoparticles. So this is an assembly of nanoparticles and from such a two-dimensional projection image, it is very difficult to determine the number of particles or to determine interparticle distances. It is only after applying electron tomography that we can see how nicely these so-called gold nanodumbbells are stacked together as a three-dimensional puzzle. A more recent class of materials that Professor Louis Lismarzan and, and also Professor Kotov and I got interested in are these um, twisted or chiral metal nanoparticles. And here you again see a two-dimensional projection of such a particle. And again, you see the need for electron tomography, especially if you want to investigate the presence of a chiral morphology, because this is something that you really need to do in three dimensions. And again, once we apply electron tomography, we can see the nicely twisted structure. Um, and this is still a relatively easy structure, but if we move to more complex structures, such as this one here, you really need to perform the characterization in 3D. So this example here on the right is a gold nanorod, um, and the wrinkles that you see at the surface are um, showing a helical arrangement. Now, these two examples, and together with the uh, uh, nanoassembly, they already indicate the interest or the value of electron tomography to investigate nanostructures, even if we are investigating um, the uh, materials with a spatial resolution at the nanometer level. However, for many years, it was the ultimate dream to also perform high resolution electron tomography and to really see individual atoms in 3D. And several groups have um, contributed to this. Here is my personal uh, journey in the field of high resolution electron tomography. On the left, you see an example of pure gold nanoparticles. This is um, more than 10 years ago. And we were super excited that um, we could reproduce the perfect lattice of a perfect gold, single crystalline gold nanorod. Now, of course, perfection is not the most um, interesting object to investigate. So this is why we also um, continued and investigated these uh, nanodecahedra in the middle uh, where several defects are present. So let me go into this a little bit further because these nanodecahedra, they are very interesting also because they yield a very interesting strain distribution. And if you want to investigate um, strain using transmission electromicroscopy, then people typically start with images such as this one here, and then again, they apply some sort of quantification procedure. Um, again, with the team of Sandra van Aert, we applied statistical parameter estimation theory, and we uh, measured the strain, and we also measured the distances between the different atomic columns. However, when looking at our results, we could not see a very, very clear trend. And at first we were puzzled, but then we thought, this is not really surprising, because the information that we have here in this um, 
image is projected, it is averaged, it's averaged over the third direction. And um, what we really need to do if we need to determine the strain is first we need to perform a three-dimensional reconstruction. Then we need to take a virtual slice out of that three-dimensional reconstruction. And then we need to apply uh, our quantification procedure to that image. And so that is exactly what we did. So here's a three-dimensional reconstruction of our um, nanodecahedron. And this a particle contains more than 90,000 atoms. Now you can imagine that that is very difficult to reconstruct because indeed, electron tomography mathematically is an ill-posed inverse problem because you have way more variables than equations, than projection images. And so the way that we overcome this uh, problem is by exploiting additional information that we have about these systems. For example, here, we assumed that every atom can be modeled as a three-dimensional Gaussian distribution. This is a very reasonable assumption, but it makes our inverse problem sparse, meaning easier to solve. And as a bonus, we have direct access to the coordinates of all of the atoms in this uh, nanoparticle. So once this is done, we can now, again, as I said, investigate uh, one of those segments of these uh, nanoparticles. And so again, we applied our quantification method, we measured the strain. And now you see that in contrast to what I showed you a few slides ago, we do have a significant trend where we see that there is an elongation of the um, interatomic distance. We're moving from the middle towards the surface of the nanoparticle. So this is surface relaxation. And also if we look along the direction of the original electron beam, we can see that the three to uh, uh, two outer layers show an expansion. Um, uh, yes. Now, um, such prior information is not always available. And sometimes you want to avoid the prior information altogether. So what we recently did is we invested quite a lot in optimizing our acquisition. And if there is time during the discussion, we can talk about this. And so um, a most a recent example of this atomic resolution uh, tomography is shown here, where we investigated, again, gold nanorods. But now these gold nanorods are welded together because of femtosecond laser irradiation. And using electron tomography, we investigated the different configurations that are formed. Um, and then we decided to focus um, on one where the uh, nanorods are welded together like tip to tip. So here you see the three-dimensional reconstruction. And here you see a slice through that data set. Now, every atom here corresponds to every white dot here corresponds to a single atom. By carefully inspecting this um, uh, image, we could pick up two dislocations. Now, that is already, I think, pretty cool that using electron tomography, one can see individual defects. But in this case here, we went even a little bit further and we looked into the uh, plasma modes. Now, there are different plasma modes, but I want to focus here on the CTP plasma mode. CTP stands for charge transfer plasma. And this basically says how well can the uh, uh, electrons move from one side to the other. Okay, what is now interesting to note is that if we have a pristine, if we have a single crystalline nanorod with an aspect ratio uh, uh, as shown on the left here, and we compare that to a system where two nanorods are welded together, but where the overall system has the same aspect ratio um, and where likely defects are formed, we can see that for this welded structure, the peak is significantly broadened and that will have an influence on the physical properties. So what we can do using our electron microscope is we can really look at the effect of individual defects on the physical properties of these materials. Right, now, um, a question that I often get is uh, why we are looking at metal nanoparticles. 
And um, the answer is that they are really, really good for technique development and for testing new approaches. But indeed, we are not only looking at metallic nanoparticles, um, and we also are looking at uh, different systems, and some of them might be very beam sensitive. For example, here, these are lead um, selenide uh, quantum dots. And you see here an uh, assembled uh, a lattice of these quantum dots. And you can see that there is a very nice long range order. But in this case here, we were interested in the interface between the individual quantum dots. Now, the problem is here that this material is extremely beam sensitive, meaning that we can only acquire one image, but then after acquisition, because of the electron beam, we have completely destroyed our structure. So there is no way that we can acquire a tilt series for electron tomography, as I explained before. So we need to come up with a different solution. What we can do is, again, we can quantify this image. We can very precisely determine the positions of the atomic columns, and we can also count how many atoms we have in a given atomic column. So by doing that, we can make a, a starting configuration, and then we are allowing our starting configuration to relax, in this case here, through a simple energy Jones potential. And in this manner, we can investigate what is going on at the interface. You see that here is a bridging um, effect. So um, this approach, uh, which I will be referring to as three-dimensional modeling based on single two-dimensional images, is an approach that we're only going to be using if we cannot acquire such a tilt series of images. And the reason for not being able to acquire a tilt series of images can be about beam sensitivity, but there are also other situations, and I will come back to that later on in the presentation. All right, so for the moment, I want to mention that I already showed you that we can investigate the positions of the atoms, but um, of course, we are also interested in chemical nature and bonding. Now, in some cases, we can um, get, get away or we can apply the same techniques as I explained before. So what you are looking at here are core shell nanorods. In the core, we have gold. In the shell, we have silver. These images are acquired using a technique that is called high angle annular dark field scanning transmission electron microscopy, HADF stem or Z contrast stem. Why Z contrast? Well, the um, intensity in the image scales with the atomic number Z squared of the elements present in our sample. And so that is a reason for gold appearing with higher intensity in, correspond uh, in comparison to the silver. Now, by combining high resolution images of uh, these particles, we can use in a similar way as before our reconstruction algorithms, and we can obtain a three dimensional reconstruction of the silver and the gold. We can also look at the interface in a little bit more detail. We can analyze the intensities, and this enables us to sort of color code our image, where is silver, where is gold. And in this manner, we could um, determine the crystallographic facets at the interface between the core and the shell. Now, not going to say that um, this was an easy investigation, but it is true that um, gold and silver are far away from each other in the periodic table, so there will be good contrast between them. And in addition to that, the interface between the gold and the, or the core and the shell was really sharp. If we have elements closer to each other in the periodic table, or if we have situations where alloying is present, we will need to look for alternatives. Now, one of those alternatives is EDX tomography. EDX is not new. I explained it to you in the beginning of the presentation. And also EDX tomography is not new. However, for many years, these experiments, they were uh, limited because a typical EDX detector would be sitting here. I don't know if you can see my hands. And here is the holder. And now for electron tomography, we need to tilt away at a given point from that detector because we need to acquire the tilt series and the detector cannot detect any signal anymore. So a breakthrough came with the development of a new uh, a generation of detectors where several detectors would be placed symmetrically 
around um, the material we need to investigate. And in this manner, there will always be a detector picking up that signal. Um, so here's an example of that. This is again, this cobalt iron oxide uh, nanomaterial that I showed you in the beginning. And a cobalt and iron are next to each other in the periodic table. So if we are using RZ contrast stem technique, we would not be seeing any contrast between the different elements. And that is illustrated here on the left in yellow. So this is how that reconstruction would look like. If we now are gonna take EDX maps as our tilt series, then we can have a three-dimensional characterization of the chemical composition. And we could see, for example, that the iron cubes have completely overgrown uh, the cobalt rod. Here's another example where we investigated a galvanic replacement um, a process and where we could also, in addition to visualizing the morphological changes, investigate the chemical changes in this uh, material. You may wonder, um, oh, right, yes, what I wanted to mention is that if you really want to quantify this image, um, then you need to be careful um, a little bit and there are several approaches or protocols out there how to do that. This is how we tackled it um, in Antwerp, and we are combining an EDX tomography data set and a Z-contrast uh, tomography data set. Right. What I wanted to mention is that these are also results that I showed you in the beginning, um, these EELS results. And you may wonder if we are also able to um, extend these into 3D. The answer is yes. And in fact, this here is a four-dimensional data set. Because in this animation, every voxel, a voxel is a three-dimensional pixel, now contains a full eel spectrum. And this spectra, we can fit to reference spectra. And in this manner, we can, um, uh, again, locate the cerium 3 plus and cerium 4 plus. And it is now interesting to note that if we have a purely octahedral particle, that the cerium 3 plus layer has equal thickness all the way around. Whereas if we have a truncated uh, octahedra, that is a uh, one zero, uh, zero facet here at the bottom has a thicker cerium 3 plus content. And that is really important if we are gonna use these particles as support during catalysis, uh, maybe to investigate the uh, metal support interaction. Another application of the EELS tomography is presented here. This is a uh, iron oxide nanostar. And by applying EELS tomography, we could reveal a core shell structure where we have iron two plus in the middle and iron three plus in the shell. And uh, we could relate that to uh, the presence of different iron oxide phases. And that's quite interesting because as you can see the lattice parameters of these iron oxide phases, they are uh, sometimes very close to each other. So it's very difficult to distinguish between different iron oxide phases. And here we did so based on their difference in valence. Okay, you might think so far so good. She's talked about the positions, chemical nature and bonding. But we should never forget that all of this was done under the conventional conditions of a transmission electron microscope, meaning room temperature and ultra high vacuum. And those conditions are no longer sufficient if we think about the applications of the nanomaterials. And so therefore, the next challenge in the field of three-dimensional characterization of nanomaterials is to again extract these three parameters, but now under more relevant conditions, such as higher temperature or a relevant environment, such as a gas or a liquid. And so that is a goal of my ERC Consolidator Grand Real Nano, where we are combining in situ investigations with three dimensional characterization. In situ transmission electron microscopy can be done using dedicated transmission electron microscopes, but unfortunately, we do not have such microscopes in Antwerp. What we do have is a very broad range of in situ holders, and using these holders, we can apply uh, many different uh, triggers, um, such as biasing, or we can heat, we can cool, and we can create environments such as a liquid or a gaseous environment. Unfortunately, performing a three-dimensional characterization 
using these holders is not a simple matter of plug and play. And there are several um, issues that we need to overcome. And one of the issues is related to the how we acquire the still series for tomography. And this I explained already to you at different angles, we acquire tilt series, but um, at each angle, we stop for a moment, we refocus, we reposition before we continue to the next angle. And even a trained user needs at least one hour to acquire a tilt series for tomography. So the first step that we had to do is to drastically accelerate the acquisition of our tilt series. And as you can see, we leave our holder tilt continuously. And rather than acquiring individual images, we are now acquiring a movie. To test the reliability of this approach, I am showing you here a comparison between two, again, gold nano dumbbells. And on the left, you see the three-dimensional reconstruction which was obtained using 49 images acquired in one hour. Whereas on the right, you can see the three-dimensional reconstruction um, based on 350 images acquired in six minutes only. And in this manner, we can combine this approach using environmental triggers. And here in this case, we wanted to see what is happening to this gold nanostar at high temperature. We were especially interested in the sharp tips, because um, these tips can be of interest for sensing. So the experiment we performed is the following. We start at room temperature and we acquire a tomogram. And now we can acquire the data for a 3D reconstruction in about five minutes. Then we are going to use an in-situ heating tomography holder to heat our sample to 200 degrees Celsius. And then we keep it there at high temperature uh, for 30 seconds, then we quench, and then we acquire another fast tomogram. And because we can now acquire these still series in five minutes or even less, we can continuously repeat this process, and we can really sample what is happening as a function of heating time. And what is happening is clear. You can see that the sharp tips are disappearing, and that will certainly influence their physical properties. We can repeat this process also at 300 degrees. You can see that the sharp tips are disappearing even faster. And um, we can also go ahead and now quantify all of this. You can see here in red where volume is disappearing and in green where volume is growing. And in these graphs here, you can see the redistributed volume as a function of time. And then you will see that most of the changes happen in the first minute, minute and a half or so. Um, keeping this in mind, we also performed another investigation where we looked at gold palladium octopods. And um, now we're going to be looking at one and the same nanostructure, but at different heating temperatures. So we again start at room temperature and we acquire a 3D reconstruction. Then we're going to heat the sample to 200 degrees Celsius. We keep it there for about two minutes because then we know most of the changes that would have occurred at a given temperature have occurred. Then we're going to quench. We acquire another fast um, tilt series. Then we're going to go to 250 degrees. Keep it there, two minutes, quench, acquire a fast tilt series. And again, we can now uh, repeat this process over and over again. And again, see that if we go higher, that the sharp tips here will be disappearing. They will become blunt. And again, that will influence their physical properties. And this is something that is illustrated here, where we have investigated uh, plasma maps, um, and where you see that the intensity in these plasma maps is going to decrease, um, not surprisingly, if these sharp tips become blunt. We also compared these results to the thermal stability of pure gold octopods, and the results are shown here in the blue and the red graph. And you see that for pure gold, that uh, the thermal instability is much worse in comparison to gold palladium. So the palladium is really adding to the thermal stability of these nanostructures. Now, these are bimetallic nanoparticles, and that made us wonder, can we also investigate changes in the composition. Because I showed you these uh, uh, images earlier, 
And now it's interesting to note that the optical properties can be tuned by changing the shape and the aspect ratio, but also by changing the shell thickness. So it is important to understand whether this core shell structure is gonna remain at high temperatures. Now, unfortunately, the answer is no, because very easily you can see that a fully alloyed structure is formed. But then we decided to investigate this in a little bit more detail. And the way that we did that is the following. In panel A, you see a slice through a three-dimensional reconstruction of a core shell structure at room temperature. And we can clearly distinguish the core and the shell from each other. If we look at the distribution of the voxel intensity, we can see two peaks, one for gold and one for silver. Now, if we keep on tracking the same nanoparticle while heating and doing the three-dimensional characterization, then it is a fair assumption to say that a pixel is always going to be a linear combination of these original intensities. And so this is how we, for every 3D reconstruction that we do, we can uh, quantify the image intensities and we can follow the alloying process. We here for um, uh, selected three different nanostructures. We have a core shell nano rod, and then we have two core shell nano triangles. And if you see the nano triangle all the way on the right is slightly asymmetric. These are the structures at room temperature. Now, the experiment that we are gonna be doing is again the same. We're gonna start at room temperature. We're gonna acquire a tomography series. Then we're gonna heat to 450 degrees Celsius. We're gonna keep it there for 30 seconds, remove the heat, acquire another fast tomogram. And then from the 3D reconstructions, we're gonna apply the quantification procedure that I've just explained. And so here is what is gonna happen and you can really follow the alloying process live. If we wanna compare between the different um, structures, we uh, better be looking at this slide here. And here we can see that the um, core shell nanorod and the core shell nanotriangle, the symmetric one, that they alloy more or less um, in the same manner. However, the asymmetric nanotriangle is alloying much faster. And so that means that subtle changes can have a large effect and that is also a motivation to perform these investigations at the single nanoparticle level. In order to investigate this a little bit more, um, we um, looked at six uh, more different types of structures. We have two uh, nanocube structures with a difference in the shape of the core. We have an octahedral core and a spherical core. And then we have four nanorods. Nanorod one and two are single crystalline and they are different in terms of aspect ratio. And nanorod three and four, they are pentatwin. So nanorod three has a pentatwin rod light structure, and nanorod four has a pyramid uh, pentatwin structure. If we compare the two nanocubes, we can again see that the alloying proceeds more or less the same. And that indicates that the type of interfacial facets is not dominating the alloying behavior. If we then look at the nanorods, we see that the single crystalline nanorods, again, more or less alloy in the same manner. And that means that at least within this range, the size doesn't really matter for the alloy. However, if we compare the pentatwin rods with the single crystalline rods, then we can see that the pentatwin rods alloy much faster. And so apparently these twin boundaries that we have, they play a huge role. Uh, we can also see that if we extract the diffusion coefficients um, here at the bottom of the table, you see that they are uh, significantly larger for the pentatwin rods in comparison to the single crystalline rods. In order to investigate this in a bit more detail, we are now performing these experiments, but now at high resolution, which I think is very cool, but we are still um, trying to see what would be the best way to interpret this data. A final example on the thermal stability of uh, big metallic nanoparticles is here. This is a gold core and it is covered by a dendritic uh, platinum shell. And what we observed is that already at relatively low uh, temperatures, 
um, there is a significant transformation of these uh, nanorods. And you can see that really large holes are formed, which is something that we investigated in a little bit uh, more detail by performing electron tomography investigations. And in this manner, we could see that the size of the holes, so the diffusion of the gold, is influenced by two factors. First, the coverage of the platinum, and second, the length of these uh, platinum spikes. Now, because we could not perform all these um, experiments with different parameters, we decided to perform some molecular dynamic simulations. And after a validation of our simulations with our experiments, we could then vary the thickness of the platinum shell and the surface coverage of the shell as two independent parameters. And we could every time calculate the gold diffusion. And so in red, you have a lot of diffusion and in blue, you have a little diffusion. And in this manner, we can prevent we can propose guiding rules to people performing the synthesis of these nanoparticles if they want to have thermally stable um, particles. Now, um, all of these um, uh, experiments were done using a fast acquisition of our data sets. Um, and we started to wonder, would we also be able to speed up the reconstruction? Because this is how we conventionally do the reconstruction. We acquire the tilt series, we obtain our 3D reconstruction, and then we're again going to go and take slices through our 3D reconstruction. And so we thought, isn't that a little bit odd? And can we not just go directly from our tilt series to our slices through the reconstruction? And that is exactly what we do in what is called the recast 3D software. And an uh, animation is shown here. So what recast 3D does is you can um, uh, compute uh, arbitrary slices through a volume um, in 60 milliseconds. And this means that sort of on the fly, you can determine which the slice would be that you want to compute. And if you now play with the transparency of the background, you can obtain a quasi three-dimensional image. And I feel this is very useful because while you're at a microscope during your experiment, you can optimize the um, acquisition parameters or uh, determine which particle it is that you further want to investigate because of this fast reconstruction algorithm. And so um, this is, um, I will uh, share the uh, link with you once more, because this is open source uh, uh, software, which is available on, on GitHub. So I all invite you to have a look at that. Okay, so I started by saying that we can use these holders as a sort of nano lab. Uh, but all of the results on the heating have been obtained using a tomography heating holder. Now, not all holders have this large tilt range for electron tomography. And sometimes the changes that are occurring for these nanoparticles are too fast to be captured, even with the fast tomography. And this is where, again, I would want to go back to the three-dimensional modeling based on the two-dimensional images. Um, this is a gold nanoparticle. It's sitting on Syria. And we're going to be looking at the thermal stability. But first, how to um, obtain a three-dimensional reconstruction if the changes are really happening on a time scale that is much shorter than the five minutes? Well, again, we count the number of um, atoms in a given atomic column, and we use that as an input for molecular dynamic simulations. And in this manner, we obtain a three-dimensional model. So this is what we used to investigate the differences between the structure at room temperature and high temperature. And for the nanoparticle on the left and in the middle, you can see that the shape of the surface facet changes. But if you look at the coordination number, you cannot see so much difference. So thermally, these particles are stable. Then if we look at the uh, smaller nanoparticle on the right, you can see that initially it's a little bit more flat. But then if you look at the coordination number, you see a steep increase of coordination number 12, which corresponds to the bulk atoms. And that is reflected by the fact that this particle becomes rounder. So this particle was able to overcome some sort of wetting effect and becomes uh, rounder. Now, because we are reconstructing particles at high temperatures, uh, chances are higher that they are in a metastable state and not in their ground state. And so we also had to adapt our modeling a little bit. And so what we do is we first explore the general energy landscape 
And then for every minimum, we um, compare the, um, the relaxed structure back with our experimental data, with our counting results. And we determine a fitness function that does not only take the energy into account, but also the agreement with the experiment. And you can see here, and this was recently published in Small Methods, that our proposed approach has significantly higher accuracy if we compare that to more conventional molecular dynamics or Monte Carlo approaches. And this approach is also going to be of interest if we are thinking about uh, looking at the catalytic activity of nanoparticles and exploiting gas cell holders. This is now a platinum nanoparticle and it is present in um, a gaseous environment. This is also why the quality of the image is a little bit lower in comparison to the quality of other images that I have shown you before. And this is normal. Think about driving in the fog, you also don't see very well. So what we do here is we acquire a time series of images. We average them with respect to each other such that the quality is good enough to um, count number of atoms in every of the atomic columns. And then again, we use that as an input for molecular dynamic simulation. And now you see that one and the same nanoparticle can look quite different in vacuum or in hydrogen or in oxygen. And you see that if we switch between hydrogen and oxygen, that a faceted structure is going to a more rounded structure. And in our experiment, we go back and forth between hydrogen and oxygen. And every time we could look at the uh, percentage of the contribution of the different types of surface uh, facets. And we could see, for example, that the um, a contribution of the higher order facets already after the second cycle is going down. That is very interesting if eventually uh, one wants to perform these investigations under catalytic um, uh, environments. For example, here we are looking into CO uh, oxidation, and we can also couple these experiments using a mass spectrometer connected then to our gas cell holder. A last example, and I just wanted to show this example because uh, not all triggers can easily be brought into the microscope. And so, for example, again, this laser irradiation is something that is not very straightforward to bring into the microscope. We found a way to go around that. And um, here you see an atomic resolution tomography reconstruction of a gold nanoparticle. And then what uh, Wiebke Albrecht, who did all this work, did is she took the sample out, irradiated with the laser, put the sample back in, out of all of those nanoparticles on the grid, she found back the same nanoparticle and again performed an atomic uh, resolution tomography tilt series. What we see is that the aspect ratio has significantly changed, but we also see both in real space and reciprocal space, the presence of defects. Now, we now have the before and after, but we don't know what is happening in between. And so what we did is we, again, use these results as an input for modeling. And what we can do now is based on our atomic resolution, tomography reconstruction, we can build a model that is more realistic than an average model. It doesn't have the same size, but it does have the same aspect ratio, and it does have the same contribution of the surface facets. Then, by modeling the laser pulse, we could relax the structure at different uh, temperatures, and we could again, we could indeed reproduce the change of the aspect ratio, but also reproduce the presence of these defects. And in this manner, we could understand the underlying mechanism, and we could reveal that because of the um, intense uh, uh, heating of this nanorod, strain was formed, and in order to release the strain, these um, grain boundaries were um, formed. And it's important to note that if we would not have used the outcome of our atomic resolution tomography to build our model, but if we would have used a more wolf-like reconstruction model, that there would have been an error of 10%. That brings me to the conclusions of this talk. I have shown you that um, using electron tomography, we are able to determine the positions of the atoms their chemical nature, um, the bonding between them. And as an outlook, um, I have also shown you that we are able to um, track heat induced changes in morphology, but also in composition in three dimensions, and that we can investigate the 3D dynamics 
of nanoparticles in a gaseous environment. I would really like to thank the entire team in Antwerp because these experiments are getting increasingly more complex and you really need a team of people to perform the experiments, but also to analyze and interpret the experiments. If you wanna be part of our team, please visit our website. Uh, we are always looking for motivated students and researchers and postdocs. And I also always uh, tweet about the um, open positions. Um, so uh, please have a look at that. Um, I would also, from the bottom of my heart, like to thank all of the people providing us with such nice uh, samples and challenging us with um, their questions and uh, pushing us forward into further um, technique development. And I would once more like to thank um, the organization and the host for having me here. And I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for an, an amazing talk. Uh, let me let me share my slides so we can continue. All right, uh, so thank you very much. Uh, I think at this point, uh, I will move to our introduce our panelists. Our first panelist uh, is uh, Professor Hu. Uh, Professor Hu and his BS and MS degrees from Wuhan University, and uh, then went to uh, Belgium for a PhD. He then came back to China as in now a professor at uh, State Key Laboratory of Advanced Technology for Material Synthesis and Processing at uh, Wuhan University. His research is aimed at advanced electron microscopy for energy materials, beam sensitive materials, and in situ TEM. He has called many, many papers in very prestigious journals. So, welcome, uh, Professor Hu. Uh, we are delighted to have you here. Our next panelist uh, is also Professor in, in the University of Beijing University of Technology, Professor Qi. Uh, she got a bachelor's. In material science and engineering from Zhejiang University, then went to uh, get a PhD in physics from University of Antwerp in Belgium, and then uh, she did a postdoc at EMAT, and then uh, she moved back to China uh, in the Institute of, um, so in a, to Beijing University of Technology in, in China, uh, where she's a professor. Uh, research interest mainly focuses on microstructure analysis uh, on energy materials using advanced TEM, including in situ TEM and 3D electron tomography. Uh, she's also a committee member uh, uh, for the Youth Committee of Chinese Material Research Society and serves in as the editorial board uh, of several journals and has been also been a guest editor on several special issues on in situ and inoperado characterization of semiconductor materials. She's very well published in this area, so welcome uh, to the panel, Professor Ki. And of course, uh, the, the last, uh, last but not least is somebody who doesn't need introduction in this forum, uh, Professor Alice, thank you so much for joining us today. We are delighted to have you here and to uh, actually join us on, as we celebrate three years of ICANX. Uh, what a brilliant idea and we're all delighted to uh, be joining you on this panel. So we can shift now to the panel. All right, any Super. questions from, from the panel? Yeah, Marty. Yeah. Uh maybe we yeah, I have a question for Sarah. Yeah. Very nice talk, but uh, it is um uh, Amazing, you know, for all these results. But also something was out of, uh, you know, my imagination. For especially the last part, you, uh, give some examples for the morphology in different uh, gas, right? The environment. So it shows different, but, uh, uh, in my mind, it's, it's really something special because I think they should be the same morphology. So did you have some uh, kind of explanation for this? Why in different gas they are shown different? Yes, uh, that's a very good question. Thank you. 
So I guess it has to do with the absorption energy of the molecules on specific facets. Um, and so that is something that we are now investigating and trying to interpret and seeing uh, what is happening. So I can imagine that um, if you have uh, different lattice spacings, that it will be easier for given molecules to, to absorb yes or no. So I think that is basically what is going on there. Okay, that's it related, you know, with the, you know, the concentration about all these gas, if different, you know, the concentration, the density is like this. Yeah, that's it. I think uh, the concentration you know, in this case was actually the same both for the hydrogen and the oxygen. Um, but um, yeah, I think it's due to the interaction between the, the, the platinum surface and the given type of molecule. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. So that's that's something you know here need to understand. Okay, thank you. That's my first question. Also, yeah, maybe for others. Uh, maybe I can comment on that, Alice. Uh, I think, uh, Sarah, I, I have to say, I was also very fascinated to see that because I've been working on uh, metals as a nonmetallurgist. And a few years ago, we saw some uh, huge impact of surface, uh, the surface environment. And we went back to the traditional Hume Rothery rules of solid solutions. And we, we actually came to understand that it has something to do with uh, uh, cohesive energy density. When you change the environment of the metal, the, met the bulk response to the environment through the nature of interactions you have. And it turns out actually the, there was a paper in 1999 in JAX done by uh, Dwayne Johnson and Ralph Nuzzo, the University of Illinois, where they were working on this reconstruction. And it fascinated a lot of people what was going on with these nanoparticles, that it, it, this atomic diffusion to create a new surface. And that um, behavior is actually trying to minimize the surface energy uh, or due to the interaction of the new gases. When you move exactly. to hydrogen, it's non-polar. When you go to oxygen, it's polar. So you create a huge interfacial stress. That interfacial stress affects the bulk. Yeah. And our work was more on looking at thermodynamic relaxation. Uh, and we found out that the, the, the interfacial energy was playing a huge role, whether a material remains a liquid or a solid. So it, yeah. it's, it's fascinating to see we are in a completely different field. I wish I had seen your work when I was writing. It would have made my reviews much better, but you bet we're going to be uh, talking about that quite a bit. So thank you very much. You're welcome. It is indeed something that is, I mean, has been observed using other techniques and also a lot using transmission electron microscopy in 2D. I think the piece of the puzzle that we brought is to really see it in three dimensions. Yep. And you can switch it. The switch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. That's quite nice. Yes. Yeah. Very good. Other panelists? Professor yeah. 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 Uh, thank you, Sarah. You give us a very nice lecture about 3D imaging and the electrotomography. I've learned a lot again. Uh, the electrotomography can give us a lot of information about nanomaterials such as the uh, precise and the real inner structure structure change with times, uh, elemental or balanced spatial distribution, even counter atoms. So uh, what else electron tomography can do in the future or in your next step? Yeah, so I would really like to do electron tomography also in a liquid. Uh, for example, if you think about these assemblies of nanoparticles, if we deposit them on a normal TM grid, uh, what is going to happen is because of drying effects, the structure is going to change a little bit. The structure is going to shrink a little bit. Um, and I want to understand how much that is and if we can overcome that using liquid holders. There, of course, you will have the um, additional complication that in addition to the rotation of your tilt axis, that also your particles might be rotating um, in a liquid. And there has been some beautiful work um, already done 
um, about particles, for example, in a liquid uh, cell or in a liquid pocket, platinum nanoparticles that rotate by themselves and where people have reconstructed the three-dimensional um, lattice at the atomic scale. I'm really interested in seeing what is happening to um, larger systems assemblies of nanoparticles. So that is something that I would um, really like to do. I would also really like to go beyond this, what I would call stop and go. Now we heat a sample, we cool it down, we do the tomography, we heat, we wait, cool it down, do that in one go. So that's also something um, that we are uh, working on. And then of course, I'm super excited about all of the measurements for helical uh, nanoparticles, because those are things that um, uh, it's very difficult to do based on two-dimensional projection image. For example, with an SEM, you can see something about um, uh, the morphology, uh, but if the systems become more and more complex and, and smaller and, and, and smaller details, we are back with the transmission electron microscope. So you see there's still a lot uh, to explore. Yeah, if, if you combine, if you, for example, the first thing, if you want to combine the liquid in situ uh, work with tomography, I think that's very big challenge. Uh, I also believe that the tomography can do a lot of things and get more information of materials, but every technique has its limitation. So what are the limitations of electrotomography? Um, well, of course, the limitation is that it is a very um, a time-consuming technique. Yeah? We, uh, we are saying now that we have reduced the acquisition from one hour to five minutes. So that's a first step. But um, then the reconstruction itself and the interpretation and everything. So it's not a high-throughput technique. Um, so we are working on ways to overcome that and to maybe find a good compromise between SCM imaging and a TEM to extract information about uh, morphologies and, and maybe to combine those things. So that is quite interesting. Um, but I would say the largest limitation of electron tomography at the moment is that it is a very time-consuming technique in comparison to other electron microscopy techniques. Yeah, thank you. That's my question, Martin. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Uh, it's always very nice to hear Sarah's talk. It's not my first time, but I mean, I'm always been uh, impressed, as always. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, actually, also following uh, G's questions, I also have some. Um, uh, questions, I would say. Uh, for instance, because you have demonstrated, uh, for instance, the multimodal and also the uh, combined with the, uh, for instance, EDX and EELS and all these uh, different acquisition techniques. Um, but for instance, uh, what is your opinion on, or what is, how do you see the development of these emerging techniques? Uh, for instance, the IDPC, and or or related acquisition techniques and how do how would they be combined together with electron tomography? Is it possible? Right, very good question. Um, because indeed, uh, so a limitation is that the electron tomography is very time consuming, um, but also it actually means that you need a lot of electron dose because you need all of those images along these different uh, tilt directions. Um, and not all materials are able to withstand that dose. For example, if we think about uh, metal organic frameworks or zeolites or polymers, so those are all very challenging materials to be investigating using a technique that needs such a high amount of dose. So as uh, Professor K correctly indicates, there are now many new techniques that we can use to use the electrons delivered to a sample in a much more efficient manner. And one of those techniques is IDPC, or in general, 4D stem techniques. And with 4D stem, we're going to collect an, a diffraction pattern at every position. And in that diffraction pattern, we are going to be looking at the center of mass. And we're going to be interpreting small changes of that center of mass. And those are a signature of the electrostatic potential. 
And so in comparison to remember the high angle analog dark field scanning transmission electron microscopy, where we are only collecting electrons scattered to high angles. A very, this is not very efficient. We're throwing away a lot of electrons and a lot of information um, that is there. So for the SIM and IDPC is much more dose efficient. We are using the electrons in a smarter way. Um, the, the issue there is, do those techniques agree with the projection requirement for electron tomography? The projection requirement for electron tomography says that every projection should be some function of the object that we are investigating, but should be a monotonic function of the object that we are investigating. So for example, that is the reason why tomography in material science um, became popular um, at the beginning of the century, whereas in biology, people had been using it since the 70s. Because for biological structures, the bright field images that we have there, they all fulfill the projection requirement. But for material science, we have a lot of diffraction contrast there. And so that is why we had to wait for techniques such as high angle dark field STEM or EDX or, or FTEM that do fulfill that projection requirement to be used. And the question is now, is a 4D STEM in agreement with that projection requirement? I think it is, but um, uh, I guess we need to uh, perform some simulations to fully understand that and also to see, for example, the atom counting. Is that something that one can do for 4D STEM data sets? So um, we have done the improvement of the acquisition, and now we have to see how can we now use that information and, again, uh, push that into three dimensions. Or maybe looking for model material or things like that to which is uh, close exactly. enough to the, yeah. uh, to the acquisition yeah. condition. Yeah, we can compare, for example, a gold nanoparticle with IDPC and then with HADF stem and see, do I come up with the same results? That's a very good approach. Yeah. Yeah, that will be the, if we can validate that, it would be already, already amazing, I think. Yes, indeed. Yeah, I fully agree with you. <laughs> and also, I mean, naturally, it will be coming up with, the, because we're, we're talking about the electron dose, uh, beam sensitive materials and things like that. Um, a natural question would be, how do you think about the cryotomo? Because I think it's been uh, talking, well, talked about quite a lot. Yeah. Quite exactly. Yeah. So in um, uh, in the field of biology, again, the, the cryo-electron tomography has been booming, received the Nobel Prize. Um, but um, again, I feel that the difficulty with the material science is that we cannot use the bright field TM. So mm -hmm. very so we are using a focus probe in, instead of a parallel probe. Mm -hmm. um, and that focus probe might, might melt the ice, I think, very easily. Yes. Um, but just cooling the sample is, in some cases, also helping its stability to withstand the, the electron dose applied to it. So probably um, there are some cryotechniques that we can use for electron tomography in material science, but um, just directly transferring all of the methodologies will be a bit more challenging. Yes, excellent. I mean, that already solves, answers many of my question and also I believe it would be the question of the uh, many audience. Thank yeah. you. My last question would be, um, because you're talking about all these development and things like that, and how do you think about the role of the manufacturers in the uh, development of... Uh, right. Oh, yeah. Very good question. Um, yeah. So one of the issues is that um, if you're doing tomography, you're doing the tilt series, you, of course, want your sample to be in the field of view as much as possible. So I had the, uh, I was fortunate enough uh, during the installation of the microscopes here to have a, 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 a technician from the microscope manufacturer to work with me such that it would be perfectly aligned for a given, for a given holder. Uh, but something that we've been dreaming about for a long time is what if, if we do not have to rotate the holder using a goniometer, but what if we could have, you know, like small motor or so 
in the holder and have the holder rotating by itself. Yes. So, um, yeah, I think that there is still a lot that can be done, both concerning stability of the columns, maybe additional detectors like secondary electron detectors um, in a microscope. There was a um, uh, uh, for example, I remember that uh, Yimitsu from Brookhaven University had this uh, SCA uh, uh, secondary electron detector in a TM that I was really jealous of. Yeah. Um, so that is something that could certainly be worked on. And then, of course, now with all of the in-situ possibilities and all of the uh, holders based on MEMS devices, I think there is also still a very large playground for further improvement and investigation. I think that's uh, quite a few um, manufacturers. They have also installed the secondary electron detector in the TM. Yes, yeah. I think there are indeed a couple of, of brands, but it's always a compromise eh? because if you have a secondary electron detector, you cannot have an EDX detector. So <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> a microscope with flexible uh, yeah. modules, that would be ideal. <laughs> That would be the development goal of the yeah. of the of the moon. <laughs> a mix and match microscope. So we look forward to the public publication of the uh, SE detectors together with tomography. I think that'll be very exciting uh, for for the people working in this field. Yes, thank you. This also is an audience question. Is Jin Shui. He is asking for where to get all these kind of tube, you know, chapters of the, yeah, and the software can work together. Is that a product? No. <laughs> I see. Yeah, so uh, every manufacturer does have um, their own software package, which um, if you uh, purchase a microscope or you have a microscope, you can ask for a quote mm -hmm. um, to get that. And then in addition to that, there are also a couple of platforms such as, um, I think it's called Tomovis, or um, you have the uh, Astra Toolbox, which is also available. Um, so there is quite a lot of um, uh, software out um, as well. But of course, the, 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 the most user-friendly option is what is provided by the microscope manufacturer. And then okay, if you want great. to start, start to do uh, more uh, complex uh, things, then um, there are probably codes also on GitHub available to do this. Thank yep. you. Yeah. Maybe I ask one last question for the non-expert who is jealous of these beautiful structures, uh, but I work with completely different materials. Now, in, 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 in liquid materials, Right, we, there's, there has been discussion about um, order in undercooled liquids, for example. That right now, you know, there are very few papers out there talking about it. Looking at it is very hard. There's also the, a, a good development in what are called porous liquids, right? A liquid that is not completely dense and, you know, has some level of porosity in it because of the structure. Do you think maybe that? that could be a potential for bright field application of materials uh, in material science based on the contrast between the molecules and the pore structures. And then for the liquid, or the liquid would even lower dose be able to give us some level, some semblance of uh, order because we are not really interested in complete order. We are looking for organized clusters navigating through space. So even a bright image Will still show us that there is order in uh, in undercooled liquid. Is is that even a possibility, or am I dreaming? So Brightfield DM was used again in the beginning of the century to look at porous materials, mm -hmm. because porous materials by themselves they do not scatter so much. So that that would be fine. Mm -hmm. The contrast between a molecule and a pore, I think, in Brightfield is not going to be that big. Very high. So you do need a significant contrast difference in order to, to see something. And now for liquids, I mean, liquids are quite complicated because bubbles are formed and things are changing and your reconstruction algorithm just assumes that it's always looking at the same thing, just from different angles, right? And I also think that the interaction of the electrons with your liquid might completely change the uh, properties of the liquids. Mm -hmm. uh, 
So I would feel safer looking at particles in a liquid <laughs> rather than liquids itself. I think that is currently still too difficult. Well, it's a challenge for the young people who are, uh, who are interested in the field. Exactly, uh, exactly. For those who are listening up there, think about how you can see order in liquids and uh, there's a whole lot <laughs> waiting, especially from a thermodynamics point of view. If you want to understand material relaxation, knowing that order is critical. It tells mm -hmm. so much. Yeah. Anyway, any other questions from the panel? All right. I, I also want to say today is very, very special because uh, ICANX started uh, during the, the pandemic when we were all shut down and everybody was isolated from each other. And we started talking to each other through this platform keeping the science alive. And so, Sarah, we're really, really honored that as we look into three years, you are our speaker. So thank you. Thank you very, very much. <laughs> it's and an honor for me. It's, it's very nice because we are talking about high resolution and pushing things beyond what we can see with our eyes. And I can access that for us. It, has, uh, it opened up that possibility that even though we, shut, we are shut down, even though we were closed up, even though we could not leave our houses and our and our, and our place of our apartments, we could still travel through the world and still enjoy fascinating science. Uh, and Aris, you're a genius. Yes. Oh, thank you so much to say that. <laughs> Actually, really congratulations for everyone. You know, yeah, in the last three years, we're really proud of our speakers. You know, yeah, we keep this I can X platform was ongoing so well. You know, everyone in the whole world, you no matter, I know many audience was in Africa, many audience was in Europe, many audience in different part of this world. So every Friday we met online to, you know, learn the most advanced, you know, technologies. Like Sarah today gave us such, uh, you know, amazing things. Yeah. Every Friday we have such, so many and new ideas coming in. So this really have a lot of people, you know, to keep the uh, eyes to see all this uh, wonderful things was happening and uh, to know all these people, you know, was hard working on that. And uh, everyone there who was really care about science, care about technology, this is a place, you know, to met online. Like Martin said that, you know, uh, this is really a great opportunity. Like everyone knows that, you know, uh, even the reality sometimes is difficult, but uh, still something can be happened, right? Yeah, you see this uh, innovations, everything new technology can make the things different. Yeah, I'm uh, so proud to say that, you know, in last uh, three years, uh, we have uh, uh, today, or we already have a 581, you know, uh, all VIP speakers, you know, panelists on this I can ask the platform. They from uh, 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 53, 50, uh, 56, you know, countries and regions. Yeah, we're really proud of that. You know, Martin, a lot of people, you know, our speakers, panelists, even from Africa, some place we never know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, they still do a lot of nice things. So, yeah, this is really great. I want to use this uh, time to say thanks to all these speakers. Uh, thanks to all these panelists, uh, you know, if uh, the challenges, uh, the young scientists, yeah, to make the everything happen. And uh, my great partner, Paul Weiss, you know, Jack Dish. Yeah. Uh, now it's a full line. Martin Meso and uh, uh, Chris. Yeah, everywhere in the world to make this happening. You know, every Friday, this really is uh, not an easy job. <laughs> it's not an easy job, you know, to get all these people to go together. Yeah, so proud of that and so proud of uh, all these people. Yeah. And uh, I think we're going to continue with deliver the message is to welcome everyone to join us, especially Martin, you know, the young scientist we yep. start this year. Yeah, you can invite them to say more about this. <laughs> yep. yeah, yeah, definitely. So, so they, they, for the uh, for starting this year, we started a Tuesday series 
uh, because this, uh, we cannot accommodate all the people who want to come. So, Sarah, as, as you work with your uh, rights group, uh, please uh, encourage some of them to come. And uh, on the Tuesday mornings, we have a series for young and upcoming scientists. Uh, they don't have to have the depth and the broad scope of the talk like we have on the Fridays, uh, but we're looking for to give uh, uh, the young rising scientists a, a chance to air out, to speak out, to interact, to engage, and to also help them <clears throat> uh, start recruiting uh, those who may be outside their field. And we feel that when we have a young scientist who can speak at uh, somebody who is emerging, they can speak to people who are looking in. Because, uh, you know, when somebody is very established, the, 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 the talks get elevated to such a level that it's really groundbreaking. Like we see all these deconstructions and all the methods that are going on in every field. But for the young people, they can narrow it down a little bit and be specific to a certain technique. And, and we would love to have more people there. And that's also another uh, platform that has uh, uh, been going pretty well. The talks are shorter. Uh, and we have two people every Tuesday, every Tuesday, every other Tuesday in English, and we have uh, alternating Tuesday in Chinese, uh, who who come here and uh, speak to the to the whole world. So we encourage everybody from around the world to come and join us. Okay, so yeah. Martin, uh, I just realized that I prepared a short slice for this. Maybe I can share with all of oh. you. Yeah. So <laughs> thank you very much. That yeah, this was uh, uh, I can add yeah. So sorry. Yeah, I have a uh, yeah. Uh, this was a third year, so you know. Yeah, we are so proud to say that now we have a yeah. Sarah, you are the number you know hundred forty. <laughs> the uh, the weeks we here we have a uh, five continental speakers and uh, from eight fifty eight countries regions we have uh, five hundred sixty seven speakers. Yeah, the maximum week we have uh, really a lot of audience online, and uh, now we totally over three hundred uh, three hundred fifty you know millions people audience on this platform. So we're so proud of that and uh, this was a uh, family <laughs> i can ask the family uh welcome everyone we will you know got all these pictures looks beautiful and beautiful make more sense uh this was this year sarah you see that and now we are here <laughs> yeah, this uh, uh, this year we're really proud to have so many young scientists here. Uh, we name a, a year of science go around the world, so we invited more and more people to jump in this. Uh, for the youth talks, uh, like this was the new things. As uh, Martin just now was uh, already comment on this, we invited the young scientists like uh, Xiao Xin or Zhi Yi. Yeah, the super young uh, stars, yeah, to give the talks. Uh, one week in Chinese, the yellow one, one week in English, <laughs> the, you know, blue one. So this was a schedule of this year. Yeah, welcome all of you to join, both of you to join us, okay? All the audience, the young scientists to join us, yeah, to send an email to us. That's really good yeah, examples. So this was something we uh, make some uh, uh, very nice club. You know, we got some, uh, uh, you know, see in person on site stuff. Yeah, if you come to Beijing, we'll have more fun. <laughs> okay. Yeah, welcome to come to Beijing. And uh, this was a uh, very nice, you know, movie. See that X. Why this is X is connect the dots. Yeah. Canal world and universe. Yeah, we use science to do that. And uh, this was, uh, I can ask the slogan here. We really want to get everyone connected on this. Well, this year, we're going to, you know, get more scientists, you know, from different countries and, uh, you know, different parts to, to join us. This was a big picture. We're looking forward to get all of your support. That's all. Thank you. Martin, yeah, yeah, that's what I prepared you. for this. All right. Thank you very much, Sarah, for honoring our special occasion. Now, if we're in person, I believe uh, we would, uh, Alice and I would be very happy to walk across the stage 
and give this wonderful certificate for honoring our 140th volume. And uh, thank you very, very much for that fantastic talk. We really, really enjoyed it. Um, and with that, I want to conclude and say join us next week as we look at biomolecular needling uh, systems for medical applications. And with that, I want to say thank you. And thank you to everyone. Bye. Okay.不再是奇迹，不再是幻想，此刻正感觉全世界离我鼓掌。不必太在意身旁惊奇的目光，可以点点头，可以放声歌唱。我创造奇迹，我拥有梦想，我希望看见所有骄傲的脸庞。再为曾经失败放弃或感伤，努力才是真的方向。I can, I can， 没有什么可以阻挡心中无限的力量。I can, I can， 你也能够像我一样飞越最高山岗。I can, I can。我可以阻挡心中无限的力量。I can, I can， 你也能够像我一样飞越最高山岗奇迹，我拥有梦想，我希望看见所有骄傲的脸庞，不再为曾经失败放弃或感伤，努力才是真的方向。I can, I can， 没有什么可以阻挡心中无限的力量。I can, I can。像我一样飞越最高山岗。I can, I can， 没有什么可以阻挡心中无限的力量。I can, I can， 你也能够像。